Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. So, over the past week, I've been working on our first round of B550 VRM thermal testing, which will be focusing on entry-level models such as the Gigabyte B550 DS3H, the ASUS Prime B550 M-A, ASRock's B550 M Pro 4, and the MSI B550 M Pro VDH Wi-Fi. I'm still waiting on a few boards to complete that testing, but in the meantime, I do have some pretty interesting results that we can look over. Since we've already looked at how some of the more expensive B550 boards compare to the likes of MSI's B450 Tomahawk, I thought it might be interesting and perhaps more importantly more relevant to see how the MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi and B550A Pro stack up. In addition to that, I've never actually done any B350 VRM thermal testing since all that testing took place after the release of the B450 chipset, so I thought it might make sense to go back and include a B350 board. In fact, the last video on this topic saw a lot of you request we go back and test some B350 boards. Unfortunately though, I don't have too many of them. But I do have the B350 Tomahawk, so I'll be adding that to the mix. And this should be an excellent reference point for the B450 and B550 Tomahawk boards that we also have. And just quickly, no, MSI has not in any shape or form sponsored this content. A lot of these boards we have purchased ourselves. And if MSI had sponsored this content, there is no way in hell they'd want us including the X570 Gaming Pro Carbon. Many of you guys will probably know our thoughts on that board. Something else we need to discuss before getting into the results is pricing. And of course, the VRM configuration for each board. The original B350 Tomahawk started life at $100 and featured a very basic VRM. The four-phase V-Core used Nikko PK616BA MOSFETs on the high side, with a pair of Nikko PK632BA MOSFETs on the low side, with a single inductor per phase. Then along came the B450 Tomahawk at a slightly higher $110 asking price, but for that extra $10, you were getting a much better motherboard, especially in terms of VRM performance. We're still looking at a four-phase V-Core, but this time MSI has upgraded to a pair of OnSemi 4C029N FETs on the high side, with a pair of OnSemi 4C024N FETs on the low side, though each phase still only feeds into a single inductor. Now, the latest B-series Tomahawk board, the B550 version, commands a $180 US asking price, and that's obviously a huge step up. However, if we look at the VRM, you can clearly see this thing is in a completely different league. The five-phase V-Core sees each phase driven by a pair of ISL99360 60-amp power stages into a pair of inductors. So that means there's 10 60-amp power stages in total, just two less than that of the X570 Tomahawk. And that means there's simply no comparing the B450 and B550 versions of the Tomahawk. They might share the same name, but they're radically different in terms of quality. And that's great and all, it's certainly nice to see that we have some higher quality options to pick from. But what I also want to know is how do the more affordable MSI B550 boards compare to the much loved B450 Tomahawk? Well, the B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi does cost $15 more than the B450 Tomahawk at $125 US, but you get stuff like PCI Express 4.0, front panel USB Type-C, and of course Wi-Fi support. And then we have the B550A Pro, which comes in at $140 US, making it $30 more expensive than the B450 Tomahawk. Now, the Pro VDH copies its VRM from the B450 Tomahawk. There is a slightly different controller revision used, but that really shouldn't change anything. The heatsink's also changed, but it looks quite good. The B550A Pro, on the other hand, is a significant upgrade offering a 10-phase V-Core VRM. From the IR35201 controller, MSI takes five signals, each of which has been then doubled using an IR3598 phase doubler. Each of the 10 phases is driven by an on-semi 4C02N FET on the high side with an OnSemi 4C024N FET on the low side. These are the same MOSFETs used by the B450 Tomahawk and B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi. There's just two more sets of them and each phase feeds into its own dedicated inductor. So in terms of thermal performance, the B550A Pro should have a big advantage over those boards. Now, before we get into the graphs, let's talk about the test conditions. For this testing and any future AM4 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system with the help of Corsa who sent over their Obsidian Series 500D mid-tower case, RM850X power supply, IQ H150i RGB Pro XT all-in-one liquid cooler, 
and 32 gigabytes of their Vengeance RGB Pro DDR4-3200 memory. And this is the same configuration used recently to test the Intel Z490 motherboards. The Obsidian 500D has been configured with a single rear 120mm exhaust fan and then two top mounted 140mm exhaust fans. Then in the front of the case is the H150i 360mm radiator with three 120mm intake fans. This is a pretty standard configuration. Airflow is good and in a 21 degree room I'd say this is an optimal setup. For recording temperatures I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally I'm not reporting delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a constant room temperature of 21 degrees. Now for this testing I've got four different configurations using three different Ryzen processors. The base configuration which I expect every board to pass with ease sees us use the Ryzen 7 3700X, a low powered part that only draws around 85 to 90 watts in our blender stress test. A lot of you have requested we test with lower end processors and while that certainly isn't particularly useful for stressing motherboards in an effort to determine which one has the better design, I figured if you guys really want to see that data we can provide it as a bit of a baseline reference I guess. Then we have the Ryzen 9 3900X which will be tested completely stock so no overclocking for that part, the only changes made in the BIOS will be to load the XMP. And this configuration pushes CPU load up to around 140 watts in our test. Then we have the Ryzen 9 3950X which has been tested twice, once stock and then with a 4.3 GHz overclock using 1.375 volts. The stock configuration again only pushes CPU usage to around 140 watts but it does so at a lower stock voltage so we're pulling slightly more amperage which will cause a little more strain on the motherboard's VRM. Finally the 4.3 GHz configuration pushes CPU power consumption right up to 200 watts, so this is our most extreme test. Again all testing has been conducted in a well ventilated case in a cool 21 degree room, so I do consider these conditions to be best case. First up we're going to have a look at the Tomahawk boards without the B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi and B550A Pro included. We'll look at and discuss the data for those boards in a moment. So with the Ryzen 7 3700X installed, the B350 Tomahawk peaked at 61 degrees, which is quite warm given the CPU used. The B450 Tomahawk reduced that temperature by 12 degrees to 49 degrees. And then we see the latest model, the B550 Tomahawk, reduced the peak operating temperature to just 38 degrees. For reference, the X570 Tomahawk peaked at 40 degrees, a few degrees higher than the new B550 model. And while it is true that the X570 board has a better VRM, it's only better at higher loads and is probably less efficient when paired with lower end parts like the 3700X. Still, we're looking at very similar results between the B550 and X570 Tomahawk, so that is a great result. Also, out of interest, I've included the MSI X570 Gaming Pro Carbon, which I've in the past called the worst X570 board in terms of VRM quality. And while it does receive a pass here, 56 degrees is a pretty horrible result for an almost $300 X570 board. In fact, if you can believe it, it's only five degrees better than the old B350 Tomahawk. Stepping up to the Ryzen 9 3900X changes things quite a bit. Not only is the B350 Tomahawk peaking at just over 100 degrees now, but the difference between it and the B450 version is substantially greater. The B450 model peaked at just 71 degrees, which is a great result, and an 11 degree improvement over the X570 Gaming Pro Carbon. It's the B550 Tomahawk though that's really impressive here, whereas the B450 model saw a 21 degree rise in temperature from the 3700X configuration, the B550 model increased by just 7 degrees and was again 2 degrees cooler than the X570 Tomahawk. Now with the Ryzen 9 3950X installed, the B550 Tomahawk VRM temp increased by just 4 degrees, whereas the B450 model saw an 8 degree increase. Interestingly, the B350 Tomahawk only saw a 2 degree increase, and as far as I could tell, it did avoid throttling the CPU in our hour long stress test. It's also interesting to see that the X570 Tomahawk only saw a 2 degree increase, but the peak temperature for the X570 Gaming Pro Carbon increased by 12 degrees. Okay, so here's our most extreme stress test, the 3950X overclocked to 4.3 GHz using 1.375 volts. Unsurprisingly, the B350 Tomahawk failed this test as it began intermittently throttling the 3950X down to 500 MHz for a bit of a breather before cranking it back up, only to repeat the process moments later. By the end of the hour, we ended up with an average clock frequency of 3889 MHz. And for those of you wondering, the board did run for 11 minutes before it began to throttle. 
The X570 Gaming Pro Carbon also failed this test, but it took just four minutes to hit its thermal threshold, and as a result, ended up with an average operating frequency of just 3,426 megahertz. A truly dismal result for an expensive X570 motherboard. Impressively, the B450 Tomahawk passed this test, peaking at 91 degrees, though it was difficult to stop the voltage drop on this board, and by the end of the test, Hardware Info was reporting an average voltage of 1.32. Hard to say how accurate that is, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was completely accurate. Unsurprisingly though, the B550 Tomahawk performed extremely well, this time running just 3 degrees hotter than the X570 model, and that saw it peak at just 62 degrees. So, an incredible result. Okay, so now I'm adding the B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi and B550A Pro to the results, and of course we will now focus on that data. With the 3700X, both boards performed well enough, and here we're looking at B450 Tomahawk-like performance, and embarrassingly, both managed to beat the X570 Gaming Pro Carbon. Stepping up to the Ryzen 9 3900X once again reveals some interesting data. Here the Pro VDH matched the B450 Tomahawk exactly, while the B550A Pro was a good bit better, dropping the VRM temperature by a rather significant 16 degrees, making it just 10 degrees hotter than the B550 Tomahawk. Again, both B550 boards were better than the X570 Gaming Pro Carbon. Now, with the 3950X installed, the Pro VDH ran 3 degrees cooler than the B450 Tomahawk, while the B550A Pro was 21 degrees cooler. So, an impressive result for both boards, particularly the B550A Pro. And finally, here are the Ryzen 9 3950X results. Interestingly, the Pro VDH ended up running quite a bit hotter than the B450 Tomahawk, though this might be an unfair comparison as the B550 board didn't suffer quite the same degree of voltage drop. So in reality, they might be much the same. Either way though, the B550 Pro VDH did pass this test, no throttling or crashing. The B550A Pro was once again very impressive, peaking at just 76 degrees, and that means you can throw pretty much anything on this board without having to worry about the VRM. All right, so that's how the entry-level MSI B550 offerings compare to the past B450 and B350 Tomahawk motherboards. In a way, the B550 Pro VDH Wi-Fi really is the new B450 Tomahawk. It just costs around $15 US more and uses the micro ATX form factor. The VRM is basically a copy and paste job, and the cooling is still good for a budget board. However, the smaller form factor does mean you're sacrificing a few things, such as the secondary PCIe x16 slot, though to be fair it was only wired for 4 times bandwidth on the B450 board, and then you are missing an additional PCIe x1 slot. The new B550 board also only offers 4 SATA ports, so 2 of them have gone missing. That said, they have been replaced by a second M.2 slot, so for many of you I think the extra M.2 slot will be preferable. The benefit of the Pro VDH Wi-Fi includes the Intel Wireless AC3168 with Bluetooth 4.2, PCIe Gen 4 for the primary PCIe x16, and M.2 times 4 slot, and then we have USB 3.2 support with many more high-speed ports. So if you're interested in PCIe 4.0, particularly for high-speed storage devices, better USB performance, and of course Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth support out of the box, then paying just $15 more for the Pro VDH Wi-Fi seems like a good deal to me. As for the B550A Pro, it's around a $30 premium when compared to the B450 Tomahawk, but in terms of quality and design, it's really a significant upgrade. Obviously, given what we've just seen, the VRM quality is substantially better, as are the heat sinks cooling it. As for the other features, well, of course, you get PCI Express 4.0, an extra M.2 slot, and far better USB support, this time including USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports for 10 gigabits per second transfer speeds. So basically, the B550A Pro offers everything the B450 Tomahawk does with a few nice upgrades. So it's not just $30 more for no reason. Now, I know a lot of people are going to jump up and down about the increased price and I get it, it kinda sucks, but at the same time, you have to recognize and understand two things. Firstly, the boards are technically better, and secondly, things right now aren't what they were back in 2018 when the B450 chipset was released. And speaking with board partners, even they seem shocked by how difficult it's been to get stock into regions such as Australia and the US. On top of that, they're seeing a huge demand for B550 products, so it's a similar situation to what was seen with the cryptocurrency boom back in 2017. Demand is heavily outweighing supply, but this time the problem isn't people hoping to get rich quick in their basements, rather it's COVID-19 wreaking havoc around the world. 
And it's not just B550 boards that are more expensive than we'd like. X570 motherboards have also gone up in price and so have countless other products. But as an example, the Asus X570 Tough Gaming was released a year ago for $200 US and it was our best value X570 pick. Just a few months after release, it was selling for as low as $175 US and until recently, it didn't cost more than $180 US. However, it's now jumped back up to $200 US and I don't expect that we'll see it drop in price anytime soon. So while the B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi might cost $125 US right now, if it were 2018, it might be slightly cheaper. Though of course it is hard, well, it's impossible to say for sure. But if we look at the trends with the X570 boards, it's fair to say that these boards may have been a bit cheaper if they were released in 2017. But as I said, it is impossible to say for sure. All I can say for sure is you are now getting a better quality AM4 board with this new B550 range. The better quality, more features. I've proven that the VRMs are at least of equal or better quality. So yeah, it's not they're not just increasing the price to be greedy or try and cash in on the popularity of Ryzen. They are providing you with better products. Whether you want better products or not, whether you just want cheap, nasty motherboards so you can stick a CPU on it, well, that's a totally different story. And there are still some cheap, nasty AM4 boards. So if that's what you want, well, you can get one. Anyway, you can expect a full comparison with all entry-level B550 motherboards on the channel very soon. So stay tuned for that. I've got a bit more testing to do, but as I said, it will be coming soon. And there are some really interesting results there. But that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, you guys know what to do. If you really appreciate the testing we do here at Harbour Unbox, you'd like to support the channel and also get some really awesome perks in return, become part of the Harbour Unbox community. Uh, join us over on our Discord channel for Patreon members. Uh, take part in our monthly live streams where you can ask questions live and listen to what Tim and I have to say about things going on in the industry behind the scenes with the channel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's behind the scenes videos as well, which you know, obviously talk more about that kind of stuff. Q and A's. Anyway, if you're interested, links in the video description, check it out. But other than that, we are done for this one. Thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.